This is the motto of the show Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, but the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman popes rule the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome's sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man, salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today, they offer up another way, a counterfeit. A compromise, beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello everybody and welcome to another broadcast on Hour of the Truth we have today Thursday, the 17th of September, 2015, a Thursday, as usual, and I welcome you all to another broadcast of this uh, wonderful platform, Hour of the Truth. Today, we, are, uh, we have settled our minds on calling this broadcast on how America became a Jesuit enclave, not only referring to the Revolutionary War, as P.D. Stewart did in his book, which we were actually planning to uh, read, but then, you know, uh, things happened that threw all that around, and we're going to make a show just uh, without any script and without probably any reading of that part that will be postponed to another moment, but we are caught a little bit in the actual facts that, of course, Pope Francis, the first Jesuit Pope, the Antichrist, will visit next week the United States of America and not only address a joint session of Congress, but later on will even go to the United Nations and do that. And on that I have, of course, a few comments. And as you probably remember from last week, I started uh, reading a little series I told you about, 10 parts, called The Signs of the Times. But before I do that, I just want to make a little mention of uh, a friend uh, that I lost today on YouTube due to he closing up his channel. He said that already before, and it's probably uh, a channel that maybe one of you or two of you have already heard from. His name was Behold a Messenger, and he devoted his YouTube channel on uploading a lot of the speeches and videos that Bill Cooper made. And um, I go quite a while back with Behold a Messenger because um, the readings and teachings and uh, broadcasts on Hour of the Time of Bill Cooper in that time helped me a lot on discovering the whole New World Order deception that we all are living in. And he stated in this week, uh, he, he uploaded a, a little video uh, saying that he will leave uh, YouTube due to um, 
copyright strikes that he got from, believe it or not, Doyle Shamley, the guy who took over the hour of the time after Bill Cooper was murdered on the 5th of November in 2001. And uh, it's a shame because I told you, uh, behold the messenger, we went far back. He is the one who even designed uh, the logo that I have on my YouTube channel, Juggler66. Uh, he made three or four designs at that time, and I chose the one that you see already there. And uh, today he has already left uh, YouTube because of this uh, copyright infringements that Doyle was uh, claiming to have for him. And uh, when I commented on his last video where he said that he will uh, go um, from the YouTube channel, he answered me in a little uh, text message that I just want to read for you. Thanks, friend. You were one of my very first subscribers on here, and we go back a long way. I've enjoyed watching you get more confident to the point where you have your own broadcast now and where it is leading you. Thank you for your friendship and throughout the years, and love to you. And I invited him also to come to the show, but he said, I won't do any shows, it was never about me. Well, that's right. It's never about him, it's never about me, it's never about Walt or any other person, it's always about Jesus Christ, as far as I can say that. So, behold the messenger, wherever you are right now, maybe you hear this, maybe you don't, but your hearts, our hearts are with you, and I thank you very much for all the work that you've done in uploading all the truths Bill Cooper uh, spread at that time because I think not only Bill Cooper but also your channel woke a lot of people up to that there is absolutely something wrong, not only in the United States of America but even in the whole world. Okay, <clears throat> I will turn now to uh, read to you Signs of the Times, The Catholic Conquest of America, Part 2. And it starts with a quote that comes from the Encyclopedia Britannica, Volume 1, article, when you look up Augustine, pages 649 and 650, quote, Aurelius Augustine, bishop, the dominant personality of the Western Church of his time, meaning the 4th and 5th century, generally recognized as the greatest thinker of Christian antiquity. Christian, yeah. He fused the religion of the New Testament with the Platonic tradition of Greek philosophy, end quote. There you can already see, of course, Encyclopedia Britannica calling this generally recognized as the greatest thinker of Christian antiquity. Well, when you mix Greek philosophy coming from Plato with the New Testament, that has nothing to do with Christianity. Anyway, Babylon deals in slaves and souls of men, as we can read in Revelation 18.13. The reason why Plato and his contemporaries are considered to be the fathers of Western civilization is because Platonic philosophy became the dominant philosophy of the Roman Catholic Church. You remember when I last week told you about the beast that looks like a leopard? The Roman Catholic Church? And the Roman Catholic Church was the dominant institution that shaped, formed, and created so-called Western civilization. The Catholic Church reigned supreme in Western Europe for more than 1,000 years, hence the term Western in Western civilization. In addition, Catholic dominance and Western civilization spread to other parts of the world during this period, such as Central and South America. Needless to say, during the period of Catholic supremacy, the Platonic system of governance prevailed in all Catholic-dominated nations and societies. This was the time of the feudal system, and it prevailed in Europe and elsewhere for hundreds of years. The feudal system is a typical example of a platonic sacral society. At the top were the quote-unquote lords of the manor, or the aristocracy. Each lord kept a standing corps of soldiers to defend his domain, which he sometimes lent to the king. And at the bottom were the serfs, also called peasants who were required to provide for the needs of the Lord and their soldiers. And at the very top of the so-called food chain sat the Roman Catholic Church. It was the Catholic Church that provided the glue, the doctrine or the dogma, that kept all and, uh, all and sundry locked into the rigid totalitarian system. 
This is classic Platonism, and it was <coughs> Western civilization for centuries. Everything was governed by rigid rules. For example, the serfs were not allowed to leave the service of the lord of the manor without his permission, and they were not even allowed to marry without his permission. By the same token, the lords could not only act and exercise their authority by permission of the king, and the king could only act and exercise his authority by permission of the Pope. Anyone who disagreed, anyone who tried to live as an individual, exercising individual rights, was ultimately, and even immediately, executed. In these modern times we hear much about freedom and democracy, and these are the ideals that we are all supposed to support and aspire to. In feudal times, the slogan was, une fois, un roi, un roi. This is French, meaning one faith, one law, one king. This was held up as the goal for all well-ordered nations and societies to aspire to, and most people believed it and supported it. So where did the individual freedoms that we take so much for granted today come from? Who was it that was willing <coughs> to challenge this totalitarian system at the risk of their lives? Who was it? Uh, who was it that we, living in this modern age, are indebted to for the courage and the sacrifices that they must have made in order to break free from this monolithic, stultifying, and intellectually crippling order? Most historians are divided about the origins of liberty of conscience and its derivatives, individual rights, religious and political freedoms, democracy and republicanism, republicanism, etc., etc. They point to many tributaries flowing together to create a mighty river, such as the Renaissance, the Protestant Reformation, the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, etc., etc. In all of the historical tomes that have been written, there are elements of a true story. However, the true story has seldom been adequately told and therefore seldom adequately understood. The true story is not of a mighty river overwhelming the monolith. The true story is a barley flickering flame that was always in danger of going out, and yet, by the grace of God, it persisted through the darkness, the dark ages, until finally it was able to burn brightly once more. The tragedy is, because we do not cherish, nurture, and protect the flame in this present age, it is in danger of going out again. The Platonic practitioners were never defeated. They have regrouped, re-equipped, and rebranded. And they are rebuilding the monolithic edifice they once had. Today, this rebuilding is supposed to be the new improved model. But is it still but is still the same platonic system of intellectual, mental, financial, and spiritual slavery that it always has been. Babylon deals in, quote-unquote, slaves and souls of men. And this was the reading of Science of the Times number 39. And we will continue, or the second one that I've read here, and we will continue next week with another part. In the meantime, I received a new email, again, the Science of the Times, and this is very to the date because it is originally posted on September 10th, 2015, and called The Papacy, America and the United Nations. And this will, of course, bring us into the direction that our broadcast is going tonight. Quote from Paul McGuire and Troy Anderson, authors of The Babylon Coast, Solving the Bible's Greatest End Times Mystery. Quote, Deep inside every man and woman is the longing for a far better world, a world without war, disease, death, and pain. Our present world is a cruel world in which every life ends in death. From the beginning of time, mankind has sought to use science and technology to create a perfect world, what some would call utopia or paradise. As the human race began to organize itself, scientific or technocratic elite rose to power by promising the masses that they could build this perfect world. Ancient Babylon, 
represented the first historical attempt to build paradise on earth. End quote. Now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3 from the King James Bible, we read, quote, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Unquote. And from Daniel chapter 8, verse 25, we read, quote, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. He will be a master of deception, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. Unquote. In recent times, the papal power has become a juggernaut. It is like a snowball rolling downhill, picking up substantial mass and momentum, and it will gather unto itself even more support when it rolls into the American cities of Washington, D.C., New York, and Philadelphia at the end of this month, or, say, next week. The papal agenda has already acquired the support of the world's labor unions with its frequent calls for quote-unquote, family-friendly, and quote-unquote, let the workers have at least one day of the week free policy by the means of legalizing Sunday sacredness. In addition, the papal agenda has also won the support of the environmentalist movement with the publication of Laudatio Si, which outlines the papal Let's Fix the Planet policy. Pope Francis' visit to America is going to be very much in the same vein as Julius Caesar's historic visit to an, uh, ancient Britain. Quote, I came, I saw, I conquered. Unquote. Who doesn't know this very important quote? Vini vidi vici, as I remember it, calls in Latin. This papal visit will be making history. It will even put... Uh, biblical prophecy right before our eyes into the life. For the first time, a Roman Catholic Pope, and let me add here, even a Jesuit, will address the Congress of America. He will be applauded, eulogized, and feeded in Protestant America. If the, if the founders of the American Republic had lived to see this day, they would be alarmed, outraged, and afraid. Having, con having conquered Congress, the Pope will move on to the United Nations. The Pope's visit to the United Nations coincides with the publication of a new United Nations initiative called Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda, or 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, described in the first paragraph as a quote-unquote new universal agenda which is a revamped and updated version of a previous United Nations policy agenda called, you probably all know, Agenda 21. The nations of the world are soon going to vote this quote-unquote transformation of our world into official international policy, which means that each member nation of the United Nations is committed to implement the policy in their countries. The purpose of the Pope's visit to the United Nations is to endorse this agenda, and by doing so, he enlists yet another powerful ally to the cause of his Roman Catholic Jesuit agenda. When one reads these policy agendas issued by the papacy, the United Nations and other governments and institutions, they most often read as if utopia, peace and prosperity are just around the corner. But the reality is far different from that. The key phrase in all of these documents is sustainable development. What does sustainable development mean? And who decides what is sustainable and what is not? Do you decide what is sustainable through participating in a democratic process? No, of course not. What is sustainable and what is not will be determined by the Pope and enforced by his newfound friends in the United Nations, the American Congress, and other governments and armies of faceless bureaucrats all around the world. And what does sustainable development mean? It means that all the powers that be, from the Pope down, will now have an open license to interfere in all aspects of human life, 
even the most intimate of human activities. For example, we already hear about the sustain unsustainable use of fossil fuels. So that will have to be fixed. We already hear about the unsustainable use of water. So that will have to be fixed. We already hear about the unsustainable growth of the world's population. So that will have to be fixed, etc., etc. Then there are the unsustainable issues that we have not even heard about yet. But as soon as the deal is done, we will soon hear a lot about them as well. The ultimate goal is ultimate control, and for no development at all or minimal. If the world population is reduced further, development would not be, uh, further development would not be necessary. The scariest part of this 2030 agenda is how they propose to fix all these unsustainable issues. One thing is for sure, the fix will not include an increase in individual rights, liberties or freedom. The fixes will not prosper the cause of democratic government. The main beneficiary will be the papal power. After conquering at the United Nations, the papal juggernaut moves to Philadelphia, where further conferences and meetings are scheduled to add yet more mass and momentum to the juggernaut that is the papacy. Soon the world en masse will be praising the Pope, whoever he might be, as the savior of the world. And why not? After all, is he not Christ on earth? According to Catholic teaching, you remember, the, cult, the Pope has the official title Vicarius Fili Dei, meaning the representative of Jesus Christ on earth. So, this finished my two readings of the Signs of the Times. I hope you enjoyed it, learned it, and please comment on that. If not here in the chat box live, then maybe later on in the video. Always looking forward to your comments. And now I am very glad to introduce for the very first time on our live radio show on Hour of the Truth, my brother in Christ over there in the United States of America. Wherever he comes from, he will tell you right a little bit about his life and how he came here. Brett Norman. Hello, brother. Welcome to the broadcast and share a little bit of your history with us, please. Yes, greetings, and thank you for inviting me on the show, and I will be happy to uh, introduce myself to the listeners um, of, by, of course, my name is Brett Norman, and uh, I'm a carpenter, a subcontractor here in Minnesota. Uh, I moved north of the Twin Cities um, not too long ago, or I should say, you know, 2006. It's been many years, but... Um, I uh, just want to give some background here quick. Um, I found Jorg's uh, show, and uh, I've been on YouTube for uh, many years, and uh, just, um, you know, I started out as uh, just a photographer, videographer, uh, musician, um, just, you know, making videos for the fun of it, and um, and then it uh, hit me square in the face. Um, several years back that um, we have uh, some very difficult, uh, what shall I say, um, difficult um, subjects to uh, look at. And, um, you know, uh, this work uh, of, you know, actually looking at history and uh, looking into the Jesuit order is uh, much, much bigger than it appears. And uh, it can be a little intimidating at first, but uh, once you get beyond the uh, the uh, intimidation, you get to the truth. And, um, and uh, as uh, Jorg and both Walt and Jorg have mentioned before, um, you know, we're, we're not called to come onto this um, show uh, lightly. It's, it's, a, it's a very deep calling. It's, um, I'm sure many of you that are, are drawn to this show are very involved with reading the Bible and uh, being interactive with the Holy Spirit in you and, and your walk with the Lord. And uh, that's what comes first. And I, I would uh, 
like to applaud Jorg and his show and um very humbled to come on online and be a part of it for a little bit here. I just was uh one of those days where uh it was raining here and uh, I had a chance to uh contact Jorg this morning and he invited me on and I'm just happy to be here and uh add any uh, observations that I might have um but uh that's a start at least and um uh, I can uh, hand it back to you, York. Okay, thank you very much, Brad. And of course, my second guest, as you all know by now, is Walt Stickel, over there from the west coast of the United States of America, in Oregon, living on Seven Devils Road. Man, why did you ever choose that place to go? <laughs> Hello, Walt. Welcome, and how are you? Greetings. Greetings to the European Union. That's uh, Seven Devils and Whiskey Run. And Whiskey Run. Oh, my God. <laughs> and Whiskey Run. <laughs> and, any, anyway, um, well, you know, I think it's a gr great that Brett come on because, you know, uh, when you really get into this history, you have to let your emotions go. And uh, one of the hardest things for me, well, this is, this is probably three years ago, was to look at the American Revolution in a historical viewpoint instead of what has been fed me all my life. And, uh, and it leads us to the 200 years prior to 1776. I've said this many, many times, and it came to me, because I'm just being honest with you, you know, it came to me myself. You see, that's too, that's like the black hole in history. And to not understand the 200 years prior to 1776, you'll never get a very clear view of what happened in 1776. And I have a lot of compassion for the people that have come on this call. We're not numerous, but we probably get 80 to 100 people a week that listen to our broadcast. And I, I'm really con – my empathy and my – and I reach out because what the people that come to this call need more than anything else is they need some fellowship. I've had one of our listeners come all the way from Washington – 400 miles. He came one last year. He came 500 miles on his motorcycle, and this year he came with his wife and visited me. They stayed in town for two days. And you see, when you fully understand the founding of the country, and you found, and you and you understand the little horn of Daniel, and you understand the man of sin and the son of perdition, and the mother of harlots and revelations. You really, it's it's really kind of earth shaking. In other words, and if somebody doesn't have somebody to fellowship with, see, yeah, Walt, you're all right. Yeah, my friend, you know, he calls me, and I feel blessed. I have one other person that I can travel 25 miles to talk about this, talk about real history. Most people, when they get a get into this. They, you know, it's hard for us not to get our emotions into it, and especially Americans, because the Americans don't understand what's on the back of their dollar bill. The 1776 that's on your back of your dollar bill is not July 4th, 1776. That is the founding of the Bavarian Illuminati in May 1st, 1776. And it's so hard for Americans, one of the hardest things, and what, what I think is so appropriate, since it is a week before the Pope's visit, and York and I, the last three weeks, <laughs> I mean, this is a very, very important read. And it's out of code word Barbalon, danger in the Vatican, 
by P.D. Stewart, Chapter 31. And the title of the, of the chapter is The Revolutionary War, How America Became a Jesuit Enclave. There's so much I want to say about this. But imagine when P.D. Stewart wrote this book and when Ronald Cook wrote the book, his little booklet, The Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy, we didn't have a Jesuit pope. And these two authors did not realize that a Jesuit pope, a counter-reformation pope, was coming to speak to a joint session of Congress. You see, our listeners here are serious. They know what the word counter-reformation is. And they know what the word Jesuit is. And last week, we covered the definition of Protestantism by J.A. Wiley. which is in the book now that I've got uh, J.A. Wiley's book, The Papacy is the Antichrist, a Demonstration. I put it in two different places, the definition of Protestantism. But our listeners that are on this call know the definition of Protestantism. But the truth of it is, as we leave and we go outside our home, go into the, go go downtown, and ask your average American, are European? This is not just in the United States. You could go to Australia and ask the same question. They do not know the definition of Protestantism. This this is this has been heavy on my heart and I'm going to take my time to be real slow. This message needs to be said without emotion. But seventeen seventy six was counter reformation. Now that is going to turn people away immediately. That the patriot community is going to act on their emotions, and they're going to stiffen. But you see, they don't know what counter-reformation means. Because you see, the Protestants in 1776 were 99% of the population, and less than 1% were Roman Catholics. How did a country that was started in 1776 become a Jesuit enclave? Now, what do we mean by a Jesuit enclave? Let's read the definition of enclave. It's a country or part of a country lying wholly within the boundaries of another. Let me read that again. A country or part of a country lying wholly within the boundaries of another. Well, I wrote that definition, my definition, by reading the definition of enclave, I came up with this one. The Jesuits are behind the American government working to attain the lost spiritual and temporal power of the papacy. The Jesuits were established, remember, they were established to regain the lost spiritual and temporal power of the Pope. That was their goal. Now, we go to the government. We go to the government that was that we got in 1776 we were officially a country in 1789 there was a lot of turmoil going on in those 13 years 
13 colonies, 13 stripes, it's all the way through the 13. And you see, the Jesuits, the Jesuits were helped write that Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, but not the Bill of Rights. There was 13 years. Those Bill of Rights are the Protestants' Ten Commandments. But the government that we got in 1789 was a universal government. It was not a Christian government. Now, freedom of religion, now the Jesuits are the ones behind the Freemasons. And the Freemasons posing as Protestants, they are not Protestants, they're Universalists. Now, I had a friend of mine argue for over an hour with me. He said, no, Walt, this is a Protestant government. Name me one place where it protests Rome. And also, we've already read this on this broadcast, and in the book, The Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy, you can turn to the, the Royal Declaration. How many people, I can tell you, I can almost assure you, that you heard it on this broadcast or my website because I know without a doubt I know the author of Grand Design Exposed who did 25 years of research before he wrote his book and he's the one that discovered it and shared it with me now, now I'm going to I'm going to bring up something that I brought up four or five broadcasts back. I brought up Eric Phelps. Now, this is not to bring up Eric Phelps. I've learned a lot from Eric Phelps. <clears throat> but the biggest deception: let no man deceive you. The biggest deception about 1776 is to cover up Rome's part in the American Revolution. George Washington, I typed that into the, I typed that into the, he was a president of the Society of Cincinnati in 1784. I'm not going to go into detail, but you have a you can do a search on Society of Cincinnati. It was named after Cincinnatus, a general, a Roman general. Now I had somebody say to me one day, you know, he and we all heard Eric Phelps say that he was a Calvinist Baptist. <clears throat> the motive, let me go a little further, because I want to stick on George. Now, George was a good old boy, okay? His neighbor was Charles Carroll. And you know, his neighbors... I'm sure they talked over the fence, maybe had dinner together. His two stepchildren were educated at Georgetown University. And old George, before the American Revolution started, see over here on November 5th, in the United States and the colonies, was Guy Fawkes Day same day that Bill Cooper was assassinated. 
every November 5th, they used to burn the Pope in effigy and remembrance because Guy Fawkes and four other Jesuits tried to blow up the parliament. The whole, they found 36 barrels of gunpowder. They wanted to blow up the whole parliament and the king to boot. And even to this day in England, they have bonfires. But England is no different than us. If you're not searching, if, you're, if God hasn't quickened your spirit to find out who is the little horn of Daniel and the man of sin and the son of perdition and the mother of harlots, you're not going to understand any of this history. George Washington was a Roman sympathizer. He outlawed Guy Fawkes Day. If we were burning, if we were acknowledging November 5th and burning the Pope in effigy every November, the Pope wouldn't be coming to visit next week. Now, I mentioned Eric Phelps. Let's put this, let's put this to bed. Eric Phelps wrote a book, 886 pages, with 700 illustrations. And he leaves out the, the carols. Now, listen, I learned an awful lot from, this isn't about beating up Eric Phelps. We're here to learn. We're not here to learn history science, like you've heard of science fiction. You know, well, this isn't this isn't fiction. We're here to learn what really happened in 1776 and who George Washington really was and who Charles Carroll. Daniel Carroll is the one that gave the land where the Capitol building was erected. And he's in the rotunda. They deified him in the in the in the in the rotunda by a Roman painter. That Capitol building, we all look at it as a house to house politicians. That is a house. That is a a temple of worship. And when that pope comes into that joint session of Congress and speaks with a fascist symbol to his left and the fascist symbol to his right, he's going to be right at home in his domain. And for people to latch on to George Washington. Now, the reason I'm picking on George, I can real easy to pick on, on, on Jefferson. Jefferson, Thomas Paine, Benjamin Franklin, they were God-haters. They were out of the Enlightenment. They were all taught Voltaireism. They were universalist. What's another word for universalist? Oh, let me say that. Let me say that. <laughs> Catholic. Catholicism, right. It's time. You see, we're running out of time. I want to be really serious. Do you realize if this broadcast, some of the comments that I've made so far, and I'm not done, were played on ABC, NBC, and the Alphabet Networks, that the Pope wouldn't be able to, he wouldn't allow it to be, a, there would be such an uproar in this country. There'd be such an outrage that the man of sin, the organization that's behind the Inquisition that killed 68 million people, the reason why we had a dark age, if 
they knew. Ignorance is the biggest tool of Rome. And so you see, it is important that we know who these founders were. Now, I'm going to tell you Eric Phelps' main objection and goal in his book. It's excellent. It's an excellent – I mean – that man is a walking encyclopedia when it comes to the Jesuits. He can give you names and dates and just keep you reeling, rocking and rolling. But understand, I said this last week, the way they took America over was with the pulpit. It's like, uh, when I may say this, it's like um, the quote that I read last week from Charles Chinnikley. He wrote it in his book, 50 Years in the Church of Rome, that the goal of the Roman Catholic Church is to take over the United States of America, and if the people knew there would be a revolution next night. But they put the American people to sleep, not only the American people, they put the whole world to sleep, but especially the Americans, the Protestants, the Protestants at that time. We're and another and another quote that I said last week, Walt, let me just add this, that was, when the United States of America rules the world, the Roman Catholic Church rules the world. And I will go into that a little bit later in the broadcast, but please continue. I want to, when you said that, it reminded me, one time on a broadcast I mentioned, I am that I, when I was driving truck from 1991 to 2001 by myself, that's why I have a lot of compassion for our listeners. You need somebody to bounce things off. It's, and I was going through Des Moines, going eastbound, going around the loop in Des Moines, Iowa. And I looked across, and you could see on this one off ramp, you can see the capital of Iowa. And I noticed the dome, and I'd been to other capitals, and I'm from Washington State, born and raised in Washington State, and our capitol building is almost a duplicate of the capitol that's in Washington, D.C. And I was all by myself, and I know right where I was. I was in the middle of Des Moines, probably the, you know, you talk about a country – talk about a state that's run by the Freemasons, I realized this is Roman architect. This is Rome resurrected. The beast and the image. Do you realize that out of the 50 states in this in the United States, 46 of them have domes? In now, I'm going to get back. I want you to fully understand Eric Phelps. When you leave out the carols, and listen, br brothers and sisters, it took me six months. I did a couple broadcasts on my own on the carols, and I was silent for about six months because I kept, a little voice kept telling me, well, is, is it important that we know about the carols? Listen, you cannot understand the American Revolution. It'll never make sense until you understand and fill in the gaps and put the carols in the right place. John Carroll and Charles Carroll and Ben Franklin went to, went to Quebec, went up to Canada to try to get some support for the American Revolution. They weren't successful. But the, on the way back, Benjamin Franklin got sick, and John Carroll took care of him for six months as a caregiver. That's history. I didn't say that maliciously, but it's not in Eric Phelps's book. Eric Phelps don't tell you about Guy Fawkes Day. Eric, in, 
Eric Phelps don't tell, doesn't have the royal declaration in his, in his book. This, and you know something? When I, we, when I talk briefly about Eric Phelps, I'm using Eric Phelps not to pound Eric Phelps. I'm using him as a textbook example, as a teaching aid. You make, you make, the people on this call, you know history. How could, how could I leave out the carols? I got the book, The Global Vatican by Francis Rooney, and you know how long he takes to get into, now this is, this is a Knight of Malta, this is an insider, this is a, a, a graduate of Georgetown University. You know how long he waits to get into the carols? The third paragraph. The third paragraph. And guess what? He tells you right in the book about the carols. And he talks about Pope's Day here in America. And how old George outlawed it immediately. And that comes up. Just don't leave, pick on just, pick on just Eric. He's a futurist also. Eric Phelps is teaching Jesuit theology. I just give you, that isn't, that isn't slander. He's teaching futurism, and we all know that Francisco Ribera wrote a book in 1590. A 500-page book on futurism. And we have every single seminary and Bible college singing the same song. Teaching Jesuitism. We talked about Ken Hovind a couple months ago. Teaching heliocentric. Who do you think got that going? Heliocentric. Galileo was a Catholic, and if, when you read about it, it's got earmarkings of Jesuit all over. And not only is Ken Hovind, te he's teaching futurism. He's teaching Roman Catholicism. Only two, a week ago, I was browsing around. Somebody sent me a link. I forget how I got to it. But it was a link on BBC on the history of Rome. And the announcer was going through the city, showing us all the old, ancient relics of all the paganism that was in Rome prior to the Council of Nicaea. I sent you that when they went down to the sewers there, right? Yeah, they, they went all the way through. In other words, and they, they're showing you all of the paganism that was in Rome. It was a Walmart of paganism. Yeah. And so, so what did they do? is they put the coat of Christianity on it. Roman Catholicism is nothing but Mystery Babylon. It started in the garden. It's nothing but sun worship. And every single seminary, I want to say this, and this is a good place to put this in. I had the opportunity, because of my website, to meet a former minister of 30-some years. And he was real interested in some of the books, some of the material that I had up on my webpage, and I referred him to several books. This was an eye-opener to me. Why? Because this minister was very, very honest with me. He said to me one day, he said, Walt, you know, when I went to Bible college, they taught us a little bit about the Reformation, but they taught us nothing about the Counter-Reformation. Well, he was taught nothing about the Jesuits. And you know he got a taste of futurism. 
you know they gave him a flavor or two. There's, there's different flavors, but it's all futurism. That's why the Jesuits took over all the seminaries and all the Bible colleges, and they did it by teaching futurism. And, and so, so, you know, this is confusing. But I'm saying this, brothers and sisters, because I know that I'm not going to have stones thrown at me. And if I say something, if I say something, like if I say something that's not the, a fact, did George Washington outlaw Guy Fawkes Day or the Pope's Day? Yes, he did. I'm just quoting history. But it's not in Eric Phelps' book. You see, this is how a confidence man works. This goes on, this is, goes on all the time. He will give you 95% truth and lead you astray with the 5%. Another word for it is a con man. Who do you think Rick Warren is? Who do you think Joel Olstein is? Billy Graham. See, we're running out of time to be bouncing around. Oh, well, you're, you're just so hard. You're so harsh. You're, you're so judgmental, Walt. The Bible tells us to let no man deceive you. And it's actually a quote from the Messiah. He tells you exactly. We are commanded not to be deceived. And if Walt's deceiving you, I need to be – see, but I don't, have, I don't have an agenda. I'm not selling a book. Now, you know, now I want to get to Chris Pinto. Now, I've learned an awful lot from Chris Pinto. And, you know, the reason I'm bringing up old Eric – you see, Eric Phelps, he would call me a Jesuit coagitator. And he called Tupper Saucy a Jesuit coagitator. He called Chris Pinto a Jesuit coagitator. The reason for it is to keep this is the most sensitive nerve in America. When you touch their patriotic George Washington, they go vivid. It's a knee jerk. They go knee jerk on you. And like I said, George was a president of the Society of Cincinnati in 1784. Found in in the in Cincinnati is after Cincinnatus a Roman general. These founders of America were not Christian. They were of the occult. And for all of these men that come forth and preach this, this is a lie. But don't re remember, this doesn't take away from the, the American heritage. The Bible, and 99% Protestants. I read, I read you the explanation, the definition last week. And that Constitution, see, the, see, see the, they got what they wanted. They got the revolution and freedom of religion. And we can see the – now, we can see the rest in 2015, can we? By 1850, they were already the largest denomination. They did it through immigration. And they're doing it again right now with the immigration from all the Catholic Mexicans coming over the southern border of the United States. Yeah, 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 yes, yes. Now – now, now, listen, I, pre I appreciate you listening to me and letting me have the floor here. 
this has been heavy on my heart. Well, you have something very interesting to say, Walt. You always get the floor with something interesting. You know that. It's not about me. It's about well, the truth. Well, it's because, you know, uh, listen, eight years ago when I started this, you know, with God quickened my spirit and I started looking, you know, I always go, you know, I, I, I don't have it right here in front of me now. Oh, yes, right here. Yes, I said this, but it, it's, you can't say it enough. This is a new author that I, I, just, I just bought four books. They were, they were, I can get them for about $5 delivered to my door, and I bought five, five of them. The book is All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael D. Simlin. This is out of chapter 19. This is a chapter. This is, this is something I read, and it just stuck in my craw. The author recognizes that for all, by the way, it's chapter 19, Bible prophecy of the Antichrist. The author recognizes that for all the weight of evidence, all the lessons of history, all the testimony of great men, the reader will not fully recognize the role of Rome, nor the roads which lead to her, unless God in his grace quickens the understanding through his word. And see, it blinds the patriots. They want to cling. They want to cling to those founders. Mm. Okay, can I uh, make a quick uh, synergistic comment to that? Sure. I'd like to share um, with you uh, uh, something that's weighed heavy on my heart. And that is, um, I think you've read from 1 Corinthians 12. Um, in past broadcasts uh, recently. Uh, let no man deceive himself. Yes, and also um, what I read through 1 Corinthians and uh, what touched me very recently was um, uh, I believe uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 uh, let's see Verse 27, or 26 for that matter. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, that God chosen, hath God chosen, excuse me, yea, and these things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Praise God. Yeah, amen. That's a very good quote that you couldn't bring up at this moment. In, in 1 Corinthians 3.18 is, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. And, and you know, this is what I'm trying to bring bring out, you know, not to tear not to tear apart and throw stones at Eric Phelps. It's just to look at the facts, the knowledge. You 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 look at the knowledge. See, we've been We've been, you know, you know, wisdom is the accumulation of knowledge, and knowledge, and, 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 and I said, no, and knowledge is the accumulation of facts. Wisdom is the ability to use it. You see, we are supposed to look. We are supposed to search. And when you find somebody, when you find Walt coming right straight out and says, let's say I said something just really wasn't true about Guy Fawkes Day, about November 5th, you have, you have to call me. And you, you see, it seems, it seems like with the, 
there's a spirit. There's a spirit that, that, that you know, we, we're the, the more the more idolatry this country gets, the more superstitious and idolatrous this country gets, the more Romanism it gets. And we're living we're living in a time, brother. I tell you, when you walk out our doors now, you know, we're seeing we're living in a godless society. And it's because because Roman Catholicism is godless. It, it's time to call a spade a spade. They have done a num- number. They have done a number on. We have had an intellectual inquisition. They knew they couldn't take us by force, so they've come at us at so many different angles. Well, Walt, let me say here they've done that before. 321, Constantine. For 10 Christians they killed, a 100 rose up. For 100 Christians they killed, a 1,000 rose up. They couldn't conquer the Christians, so they baptized the pagan Roman Empire. And they've done exactly the same thing with Vatican II between 1962 and 1965 and the ecumenical movement. They couldn't get rid of the Protestants in a normal way, so they embraced them and put them back under the wing of the Mother Church by the they ecumenical movement and by teaching before a hundred years before that started, teaching futurism to take the eyes of the papacy. Exactly what Ribera intended when he wrote his book between 1585 and 1590. And they're doing it again. There is nothing new under the sun, people. It's all been here. And if you do not know your history, that's the problem, then you will not see that. And that's why we are making this point. There is nothing new under the sun. And the new world order is nothing else than the old world order restored. And if you do not know the old world order, you will never understand the new world order. And you will never see that they are just taking the same steps. The United States of America now at this moment is at the same turning point that Germany has been at the end of the 1920s and the beginning of the 1930s. And when you do not see that, you will be surprised what becomes out of your free so-called republic that you all love so much. And you do not see that every piece of liberty and freedom is taken away from you piece by piece by piece. And, And they're doing it. They're doing it intellectually. The Jesuits have 28 universities. The word university is a, comes from Rome. All these universities in the public schools, they're completely, they're doing it. They're, they're, they're doing it through mind control. They're turning, we have, instead of killing people and torturing people, we have a lot of people walking around that are dead. They're dead. They're walking around looking into a box. And, and the, the, they've, they've put all this entertainment on us, the sports, the football, the movies. You, you cannot endure, you cannot put a young mind in front of, these, in front of the, the pulpit, and the pulpit is the TV now. You can't do it. And see, we and I, I, I had a fellow the other day. I was talking to him. And he said, "He said, Walt, I don't, I don't think the Inquisition ever ended. No, it never did. And after the war, after they killed 60 million people in World War II, the Second Thirty Year War, they, they, they pointed their, they pointed." Everything at the United States. This country, there's not a country that's been bombarded more by psychological warfare than this country. And now it's the world. It's not just the United States. But listen, 
don't the Americans have have been have been lulled to sleep, and the, the, this and not and the reason I go to the founders is that is the root. You've got to see that these these founders were scoundrels. They, they weren't they weren't of God. They weren't men of God. I could stop here and start reading quotes from Jefferson and Thomas Paine. It's in the book, The Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy. We've already read it on this broadcast. But the reason I bring this up, this is key. And what was was Eric Feltz, what's his motive? Is to keep people away from the true founding of America. We got we got a whole army, a whole army of these men teaching that these founders were Christian. Look at look at the layout of Washington D.C. You know I I, I appreciate you listening to me because I you're, this does this. This works on everybody that's listening, just like it's doing me when I'm I'm sharing this with you. Look, you can take a Google aerial picture of Washington D.C. and you can see the pentagram. And we got a, we got a military a pentagon, forty acres, and we got we got what we call a Washington Monument. We got we got one we got two of the biggest obelisks. In the world, right here in the United States, one, I always thought it was Washington Monument, but there's one in Texas that's about 20 feet higher. And there's an obelisk. I mean, when you find a dome, look around. There's going to be an obelisk. And how can, you know, what is it, uh, what is that fellow's name? That David Barton. Can you imagine? He takes guided tours through Washington. Now you know he rolls up and r- 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 the bus rolls up and lets out all the tourists in front of the Washington Monument. Does he tell them what that Washington Monument represents? Now getting back to that that pe- that, that, that video that was sent on the history and the founding, how how Rome. You know, the history of Rome and the pagan Rome and how it warped into Catholicism. Well, it's a carbon copy. We have to open our eyes. Now, I could be talking fantasy, but the reality is we are living in exactly the same stage as Rome. We have all of these churches out here teaching futurism. They're Roman Catholic. And they don't even know it. Let no man deceive you. And the Bible tells us that the whole world will be deceived. It happened. And it says that the the whole world will wonder after the beast. You don't think that, that they're going to wonder after this Jesuit Pope when he comes over here? He's going to speak at the Freedom Hall? In Philadelphia, using the same podium that Lincoln used at the Gettysburg Address, these people are wicked, wicked to the bone. And the reason why this country, I, I'm not anti American, but my eyes are open. We. We have been conquered. Listen, the Pope came here in 2008. Ratzinger came here in 2008, and the and, and the Knights of Columbus saluted him, and they, they had a they had the fife and drum corps march in front of, and they were celebrating the winning of the, of the, of the, of the American Revolution. Now, now, as Bill Cooper would say who benefited from the American Revolution <laughs> I mean I mean it's so evident 
it's so evident. And we and now when we we look at P.D. Stewart's book, you know, and and he talks about how America became a Jesuit enclave. It's happened. The Jesuits have been kicked out of 80-some countries. They've never been kicked out of this country because they helped find it, found it. Listen, listen, they didn't get everything they wanted. Like I had a listener from Alabama, and she knows who she is. She set me straight one day. See, if they got everything they wanted, we would never have had 9-11. 9/11 was the was the final thorn in the side is to take is to get rid of the Bill of Rights. We don't have a Bill of Rights no more. And all the gun laws that they got, you know, you, the Bill of Rights it is in and and 9/11 was. You know, I started laughing this morning. 19. You know what they told the American people? You know how far the American people have in the world? They did this to the whole world. They said that 19 guys, 19 camel jockeys with box cutters hijacked airplanes and drove them into buildings. And the buildings, as soon as the, the – and then they, when they hit, there was a – 20 minutes later – 500,000 tons of material turned to dust, and there was a crater at the bottom. Those buildings disappeared. And all of this that we're seeing is a, on 9-11 and all these documentaries is to cover up what really happened on 9-11. They got a, they got a weapon that they can – they got a weapon that they can take a building down and make it and turn it to dust. You're talking to a pilot. And on July 22nd, 1980, I went down with my wife at 5,000 feet and photographed the second eruption of Mount St. Helens. You say, well, what's Mount St. Helens got to do with 9-11? Well, the whole north side of that mountain blew. And it went up to 30, 40,000 feet. It went all the way to, to Europe. You say, well... Well, what's that got to do with 9-11? The dust was the same consistency. What happened in 9-11 is the building, they turned it to dust. Did you see the big clouds? It left town. It blew away. And the Bible instructs us to let no man deceive us. And now I'm going to get back to Eric Phelps. Eric Phelps is a Jesuit. Now, I might be a Jesuit coagitator in his eyes, but he is a Jesuit. He's been mentored by a Jesuit. Walt Stickle hasn't been mentored by a Jesuit. He even admits to being mentored by a Jesuit. Dresses up in the cloak and goes to these prophecy conferences dressed up as as a Jesuit. What does the Jesuit oath just tell us? That Jesuit oath tells us that they'll come over here and they'll act as carpenters, teachers, ministers, and deceivers. And he's a deceiver. I got his book. Sixty dollars I spent for that book. I'm not mad that I didn't get it. How 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 did I come to the realization that he's a Jesuit? It took years. I had a friend of mine when I would bring this up years ago. I could sense something wrong, and he would get so defensive about Eric. Oh, his boy would. Oh boy, don't touch Eric. And I'd back off. But when I started doing my own research, and you find out how instrumental the, the Jesuits were, and this idea of the Jesuits being suppressed 
in 1773. You mean all of a sudden the Pope over there signs a bull, boom, and they all evaporated? John Carroll didn't evaporate. Charles Carroll didn't evaporate. Daniel Carroll didn't evaporate. And if you want, if you want an, an, an extensive master degree on Catholic history, Tom Fress of Inquisition Update, as, as reading that whole book, that whole book. I don't know how many recordings now. I've, it, uh, 63. Uh, 63. Uh, he's got a playlist up there. If, you, if you're a doubting Thomas after this hour, if you've got any, I, any doubts, you read firsthand from an insider. They are so bold in what they tell you. Because it doesn't you know matter why? anymore. It doesn't matter it anymore. Doesn't. There is no resistance. There is no protest. There, that's the, 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 it's because because of the of the of the of the intellectual inquisition. Now I'd like to just kind of close with this a little bit and kind of finish off what what, what I was trying to get across. You say, well, Walt, what do you mean an intellectual inquisition? Well, a baby's born. They give them 32 shots by the time they're two years old. They start feeding them GMO foods. And then they put them in public schools. And you, do you know that 50% of the public schools are on medication, Retlin and Prozac? And then they feed them for, with these games. They're godless. All these games and entertainment. Hours and hours. I don't take no crazy. You say, well, you, well, you're trying to be holier than thou. You know, you're being judgmental. It's only by the grace of God that I got my sanity. It, it's only it's it's and the fact that the fact that that I I for ten years. You know, I researched, and, you know, I knew a little bit about Rome, but I didn't consider Rome a player because I didn't know my Bible. You see, I didn't know my Bible. And I, I, I can't go to it right now. I wish I had it, but in, in, um, in Wiley's book, he tells us it's so evident. I, I've heard uh, Tom Fress say this. See, you know, it's so evident who who our Messiah is. God has made it so clear, told us when exactly when he was going to come and how long his ministry was going to be. And you don't think, and, and, and Tom got it, because Tom's read this book two or three times. The book I'm talking about is The Papacy of the Antichrist, that demonstration. It's up on my website. You know, I haven't read it chapter by chapter, but you can grab a hold of any chapter in this book. And J.A. Wiley, the papacy is the Antichrist, a demonstration. What he's doing is like he's laying it out to a jury of 12. He's laying the facts out. If this book was presented in a court of law to a jury, they'd convict the pope as the Antichrist. This this is and you can you can have this book up it's up there on on the Grand Design Exposure. You can download it. But the Inquisition that's why I'm thankful that we had Brett come on today because he's no different than my friend in Pasco. I got a Canadian now that's been calling me. Calling me long distance. I'm sure he's got unlimited long distance. But he don't have anybody to talk to when he leaves the house. 
There's a lot of people. I mean, we're not out there in number. But we're there. We're there. Yes, you sure are. And it's the truth. It's, and the truth is, is, in, is kind of intimidates you. I mean, it works on you, especially when you don't have anybody to fellowship. Yeah, Brett, you're all right. You're seeing the way. I mean, two and two is four. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But see, when you listen to some, when you listen to some of this, this distorted history. Oh, I agree. I agree a hundred percent with you and your comments on uh, Eric Phelps. In fact, uh, I made a recording last night, and uh, I was thinking about making a video. I just. Uh, uh, you know, stretch for time here and uh, always fighting that. But anyway, um, yeah, Eric Phelps, um, I've been following him for uh, a good long time. And um, and I've also been friends with uh, another fellow online. Uh, uh, we are one big family, Alric Wiley, too. Oh, yeah, and, but he is one of the biggest fans of Eric John Phelps, and Eric John Phelps I cannot know. say one word wrong in the eyes of Eric Wiley. I'm very sorry yeah. to say that. I must agree, but, however, don't give up hope. <laughs> um, you know? I mean, really. No, no, I agree with you, Brett. Um, I, I agree with you. You know, you know, that's funny because it's interesting how we got into the subject because um, in a, there's a saying here uh, that my uh, my grandparents or my parents have been saying is that uh, life begins at 40. <laughs> Was that a movie? Yeah. Or something? That's but an old that's an old saying too. But it's an good. old saying, but there's some real truth to it. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And uh, you know. When I first met you fellows on Skype, and I was just saying I'm a babe. Well, that's what I mean. Is, is you know, I'm I'm just coming into this as an adult and looking at this, and my jaw just continually is hitting the floor. Ever since I heard Tom Press for the first time on that wonderful broadcast that you fellows did, and if anyone's listening. You have got to check that out. If you've never checked it out, for any new listeners, you have to check out uh, the Nothing But the True show. Uh, what was the name uh, when uh, Lamb speaks? Uh, like you, mean, you mean about uh, Pope Francis' visit? Yes. When, yes. when the Pope visits uh, the U.S. in 2015 and when the Lamb speaks as a dragon. That's uh, correct. That, that's correct. I'm, I'm very glad that you bring that up, uh, Brett, because I was waiting for a moment to bring that up in uh, reading Revelation 13, starting in verse 11. There are some things that I want to share with you guys, and this fits into what we are talking about tonight. Verse 11 reads, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him which is the papacy, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed, and doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, and that the image of the beast would both, listen carefully, speak, and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, I want to turn your attention to the following. The image of the beast is the United Nations, created by the United States of America through the Knights of Malta, and now the first and the Pope first addresses the joint session of Congress next week, and then he addresses the United Nations. Isn't this fulfilling Revelation 13, verse 15? Quote, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. You know, this reminds me of Daniel when he says that the little horn had eyes like a man and a mouth like a man. Isn't the Pope coming over to the United Nations next week and speaking there 
giving life to the image that was created. The United Nations is, select, is the selected entity for world government acting as the front organization for the Vatican that leads the United Nations from behind the scenes. You guys got any thoughts on that? No, it's it's pretty self-evident. Uh, what what uh, I mean, it, it it makes it makes revelations come up come alive. We are seeing yeah. next week Bible prophecy fulfilled right before our very eyes. Yes, yes, yes. You know, I want to say something to what uh, Brett said. Understand, I called. Uh, Eric Phelps, a Jesuit. Uh, let's put it this way. What I really mean, he's a Jesuit teacher. How deep he is, I don't know that. But I know for a fact that he, he's been hiding information. See, it's not what he's teaching. It's what he's leaving out. Well, I should comment quick on this. Um, I've been noticing, uh, yeah, I just wanted to quick say that um, I have noticed there's uh, quite a bit of suspicious things in the system on Google+. Plus. Um, and I just thought I'd bring that up because um, I've witnessed some pretty strange behaviors, and we can expect this. It's part of the structure that they've created. And uh, I don't know how integrated Eric Phelps is into this, but it appears to be very uh, controversially deep. <laughs> Let's just well, say that. <laughs> well, see, to, to come to this conclusion, to come and say this on a broadcast, because this is a recording, my voice is being recorded, and it can be played over and over. And so what I say cannot be taken back. But I'll tell you, the answer for Eric Phelps is like any man. When you're showed you've made a big mistake, you repent. This is one of the biggest things that, you know, that I've learned by understanding Rome's play in the world is I've had to repent. I had to repent of my patriotism. I love this country, but I am not a blind patriot. I cannot be blind to George Washington. I cannot be blind to Ben Franklin. I cannot. I've walked the streets. I've landed my little 150 back in 1977. I landed at Dulles. On a 10,000-foot runway, thought I was going to run, run out of gas by the time I got to the to the, to the tie-down. Dulles, is, Dulles Airport's named after a Jesuit. Okay, you know, but and this system, we got we got 28 Jesuit universities, and you see, see these ministers, these ministers that have graduated out of Bible colleges and seminaries are teaching, teaching Jesuit theology. They're teaching their mother. They are the harlots of the mother. And it's so evident today. Oh, 14 or 15 years ago, if you said anything about Billy Graham or something, and boom, Billy Graham was a, he's a 33rd degree Mason. I mean... I mean, and, and, and listen, you'll know them by I, I, you'll know them by their fruits. And I, I'm not condemning, I'm just not condemning Eric Phelps. But Eric Phelps is in great error. He has lied. No, I, I t take that back. He has left out. But he, he, he lies by omission. You see. You go through that Vatican. You you study. If you haven't read the Royal Declaration, you'll understand what a Protestant co country was about. This country's government has never been a Protestant government. 
It's been a universal government. Listen, listen. the reason why we prospered is because of the 99%. And the Jesuits, went, they went right to work. They went right to work. To, what, did, what, did, what were they doing? They were. The Jesuits are behind the American government working to attain the lost spiritual and temporal power of the papacy. The Jesuits were established. That's what they were established to do, to regain this lost spiritual and temporal power of the Pope. And a Jesuit Pope, in people, I just said this to a friend of mine this, this morning, you know, and I, I, I got it right up on my website. Is the Pope Catholic? No, he's not a, he's not a Catholic. That was, that was the Jesuits' goal from the, from the very beginning. I remember when Tom Fress was reading Footprints of the Jesuits. And, and he came to that chapter, you know, and it was the goal of the Jesuits right from the beginning to take the papacy over. Counter-reformation. You see, and, and so the brothers and sisters on this call, there's only a few of us. There's only a few of us. I mean, and there's there's no, you see, uh, I don't. You don't have our agenda. Is the Bible, God's word. God's word tells us who our enemy is. And 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 the and and all the churches in America. Every single one of them. It, it, it didn't. It didn't take over. Francisco's book was written in 1590. It took. It took a couple hundred years before this to take hold. But we, in reality, we are living in an intellectual inquisition, and and people are not. You're seeing it. They, people cannot think. They've taken the ability to think, to be an individual. We're taught to think as a group. That's a good uh, and now, uh, good uh, observation, Walt. Um, intellectual uh, inquisition. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In other words, we're looking for the. We're looking now. There's going to be a physical too. Don't don't get me wrong. It's going to go physical. But we have a lot of people that are walking around. Nobody's saying anything about the Pope. This is a historical moment in history, in American history. Yeah, we shall take another look at um, the broadcast we did on Nothing But The Truth at the time. The externalization of the hierarchy and the ten satanic commandments coming out of the United Nations, starting with the teachings of Helen Blavatsky, who was overseen by Albert Pike, who wrote Morals and Dogma, and then continued by Alice Bailey, the founder of, founder of Lucifer's Trust Publishing Company, which today still is the United Nations official organ under the name of Lucifer's Trust. You, you know, and I, I want to leave you with this, too. You know, we talked about some real dark sides. I mean, we've seen when you see it the way it is. But we are the winners. We are the victors. They can't. They can kill you, but they can't take your the liberty that you have in Christ. They can't take that away from you. When we are the victors, we know the beginning. God has given us a, His Word of God, and we know the beginning to the end. And and, but but uh, but I we ha I have to be realistic. I have to look out, and realize what part of history I'm living right now. I'm not living in the '60s, the '70s, the '80s, the '90s. I'm 71 years old and a baby boomer, and I watched the revolution. We've already had one major revolution since the since 1776. And a lot of you have, weren't around when it started, including York. But it started in the 60s. The revolution that really took hold. You had, com, 
you had was it Comstock and you had the Beatles coming. I mean, they and they 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 hit us with the music and the drugs. And taking out the prayer of the school in the morning. Taking the prayer out. I mean, they just completely have come after the destruction of the American family. Introducing of the drugs. Introducing yes. introducing the divorce because from 96, uh, 1968 on, the divorce rate skyrocketed in the United States of America and in other countries in the world because of this Jesuit devilish That's, agenda. It, my friend Dave has got uh, he did some uh, graphs on this. I mean he's brought this up to my attention three four years ago. But you know I want I want to be realistic with you. It takes time for some of this information to take hold and really realize what it means. I remember my friend Mike Luckham teaching me about the Society of uh, 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 Society of Cincinnati. I didn't really understand it until this morning. George Washington, I mean, and, and, you know, it was founded after the Society of Cincinnati. I'm repeating myself, but really, it's, it's really when you understand what this means. I mean, George Washington was not a Christian. He was a Mason. Not only a, a Freemason, but he was a member of the Society of Cincinnati. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's in other words... Because they hold on to George. The reason I, the, the key to it, you see, you, you can't, you can't, if, if somebody tried try to hold up uh, Thomas Paine, I can, I can re refute Thomas Paine real quick, and same as Thomas Jefferson, same as Ben Franklin. I mean, all you got to read is their writings, you see. And this, this, this broadcast, we've tried to read this chapter. This is the third time we didn't get to the book, <laughs> but I'll tell, you, I'll, I'll tell you where it's at. It's on button 14 on rulers, on uh, right. randesignexposed.com. Button 14, it's, it, it'll take you to that chapter, and you can read the chapter for yourself. We will read it eventually, Walt. But 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 the, you, you know the you know the thing the thing that got me. I don't know if we have to read it again because I think all our readers will. I, I noticed. When we talk about something, I notice that people click on it because because of the broadcast, you know. But but it it it, it the reason why is every time I would come to the title "How America the American Revo it's, it's titled "The American Revolution: How America Became a Jesuit Enclave." Well, people say. Well, people won't want to argue 1776 and get all upset when you say that the Jesuits had a little – had a hand in the founding of this country. Who did it benefit? What did the Protestants gain? They didn't – and what did the Roman Catholics gain? They had nothing before 1776, and they got it all. And the Protestants Catholics. lost it all. And the Protestants lost it because that is when the ecumenical movement started. It started in 1776 because the Catholics. Oh, and, and by the way, uh, I'd like to do a broadcast maybe on Sunday, and I'd like to cover the first chapter of Global Vatican mm. because I, I, I'd like to uh, arouse enough interest that people will get on that playlist if you want a master's degree in American history you will listen to an insider not Walt Stickle I mean this guy is an insider Francis Rooney but when you listen to Tom read the book he, he's he's going he's, he's going to show you where what they're in, in a lot of time what Francis does in the, in the reading so far is what he leaves out. He 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 operates just like Eric Phelps. Well, the interesting thing, Walt, about that book is that it is written by a Catholic for Catholics, and Tom Fress reads and explains this book from the standpoint of a Protestant, 
And that's what makes his reading so valuable and so interesting. And I can assure you, if you, have not lis if you have not listened to it yet, do that. You will sit there with your jaws dropped to the ground. And you can get, you can get the book very you can get the book very reasonably by going going to Grand Design Exposed and and I've got a I've got a a, a page up there on my uh, uh, or it's, it's on my home page. Uh, what's it called? It's uh, oh, a Grand Design Exposed disclaimer right at the very top of the page. It'll send you to uh, see, see. There's another book uh, called The Grand Design. We're going over a little bit here this week, but this is important, vital information. If you want to, if, if, all you got. To, in other words, the dots are here. I, I try to give you the dots, and you, anybody can connect the dots. I mean, it's like what I try to do in a nice way with Eric Phelps. You know, I, I'm just telling you what Eric's leaving out. If I left. There wouldn't be nothing on my website of any value. Everything that's on my website, he's left out. See, mm -hmm. and so so when when you click on the the, the 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 disclaimer, I did a I did an article. See, I got the book. There's there's another book by an insider. It's called The Ark and the Dove: The Beginning of Civil and Religious Liberties in America. And by J. Moss Ives. Now, I used to recommend that to people and stuff, but I, you know, before you get into that book, you uh, you have to understand casualty and sophistry, and you need a little bit of history because because these 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 writers write with mental reservation. Now, mental reservation is a Catholic word. You say, well, what, is, what does mental reservation mean, Walt? It means a man can look you eyeball to eyeball and lie, just lie right straight in your eyeballs. And believe it. There isn't an organization that is more adept at writing Jesuit casuistry and sophistry than the Roman Catholics. I mean, I mean, when when they're the minority, oh, they whine and whimper. Oh, everybody's picking. You know, can you imagine when they're over here with thirteen colonies and they couldn't even they couldn't even say mass in public? Reason why? Well, why were the Protestants so angry and so so stiff? Well, they knew history. They knew if they allowed them to get into the civil power that they would pass laws and take their freedoms away. Have you have you felt any freedoms slipping by us? <laughs> At every angle. The other day, I had a chance to witness. You know, wh wh who do you think legalized sodomy in this country, see? When I mentioned this, well, I said, did you, did you realize that six out of the nine chief justices are Catholic? Oh, 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 yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They make such a big deal. Listen, the Roman, why is, and once you know history, now you understand why we have, why we've legalized sodomy. Because the more Romanism you get into, it, the more, the more superstitious and idolatrous and that's what the English people called Roman Catholicism. And these, and these, and this is where old Pinto, Pinto Chris Pinto, falls short. <laughs> he, don't, he don't tell you this now. Now, he's four. He spent two whole broadcasts advocating Christmas, okay, and pounding the drums of Christmas. But prior to, prior to 1776, you got caught celebrating Christmas, it put you in the stocks. These people knew the Bible. They knew where Christmas came from. I mean, it is, and, and, and I call Roman Catholicism the Walmart of paganism. Any kind of paganism you want, it's, it's, at, the, it's at the Roman Catholic Church. 
and and you know and and you know uh, I didn't understand this until one time one time I heard Tom Fress talking about it. Then I looked into it. This country is divided up into 195 dioceses. That's the shadow government. Now, 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 listen. You don't have the, the Jews don't have this country divided up into 195 dioceses. And, 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 and you know, the, the, the Lutherans don't, the Methodists don't. But the Roman Catholic Church has got this, and the, and the Jesuits got it divided up into ten regions. I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, and FEMA is in ten regions. I don't know if the two coincide, but I imagine they do. I mean, I don't want to go there, but, but, but that is the shadow government, and they started off with five in this country, five. You know, and for people to sit here and pound and try to elevate. George Washington. Listen, you know when I get across somebody like this, when somebody says something like this, I realize they just don't have enough information. If you will study true history and understand those 200 years prior to 1776, everything that we're talking about comes falls right into place. It fits like a glove. You'll understand totally why the Pope's coming over here. And, and, you know, as far as a child of God and the people on this call, you know, when the call ends here now, if you've got somebody else that you can talk with, if you've got a wife that, will, that you can converse with and understand this, you're going to have a marriage. You have to know who your enemy is. And I'm telling you, they're after the family. At every turn, the Jesuits are after the family. Because you know what makes a strong country? You know what made this country strong? It wasn't the United States government. It was the Americans that made this country. The American families. Man, I'm telling you, I could talk. I mean, I flew across the United States in 1977. I landed in in Butler, North Dakota, at a wheat farmer's that I knew. He was a beekeeper also, and I was a beekeeper. I landed in about a 20-knot quartering crosswind with telephone poles on my left. It was the only time my wife ever said, good landing. She was so damn glad that we were on the ground. We landed and taxied into this farmer. And on the weekend, Jimmy Carter, he was president, and he took us to church. So a little church out and sitting out in the middle of nowhere in North Dakota. You know, I've had a bird's eye view of Iowa, Indiana, Illinois, especially in Illinois. You get airborne in Illinois and you look at 360 degrees like where, where uh, Charles Kennequay, St. Anne, you'll, you'll see – Nothing but farms. And the reason why this country prospered is because of the of because they of protestantism. And that's why on our last broadcast, protestantism is much bigger than just protesting Rome. But I'll tell you in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a short, it's the opposite of Romanism. And the more Romanism you get in the country, the more poverty you'll see. And yeah. we've seen this as Americans happening over. We've seen this creeping up, creeping up. Look at Latin America. Look at Italy. Look at Greece. There you got it. Well, I, wanted, right. I wanted to make another point because you were mentioning when you go – fly over Washington and take an aerial picture, you can see the pentagram in there. One of the biggest deceptions a lot of people do not even understand is right there in Washington. It is called the Lincoln Monument. What have these wicked Jesuits done with the one of the greatest presidents the United States of America ever had, Abraham Lincoln? They put him on a chair 
where he rests his arms on Fashai. That's exactly. If Lincoln could see that, he would take a bulldozer and tear it down. And nobody who is watching that even has a clue what it is all about. Absolutely. And you're, you're talking to somebody. When I landed there in 1977, Dulles Airport is about 20, 25 miles out of Washington, D.C. And we took a bus to Washington, got into a motel. And I used to do a lot of running in those days. And, uh, I, I mean, both days I'd run down to the mall and run up those steps and that statue of Lincoln in the Wash in the Lincoln Memorial is is it looks like he's sitting there. I'm telling you, but just like York said, I didn't have an, any idea what his two arms were resting on. And and I'll tell you one more thing about Lincoln. One time when I was driving truck, they gave me a real short load, and I said. Uh, you know, I had real short loads because I could drive there in a couple hours. And so I asked him if I could go out a route to go to Springfield. And so I went to Springfield, Illinois, and then took a taxi cab out to Lincoln's old home. And he's got a little – there was a little museum there. And after that, I took a bus down to, to the cemetery. Now, they put Lincoln in a big obelisk. It's a big obelisk. You can walk underneath, and that's where he's, he's entombed with uh, his wife. And I was, as I was coming in, as I was coming in, they handed me a brochure, and I walked around the circle and came back. And understand, I had listened to a broadcast by a Stephen, by a Stuart Crane. And you see, the, the Lincoln, the Lincoln uh, party that Lincoln wrote a, uh, run on was an anti-Mason party. Few people realize it. See, you know, and, and of course, so Lincoln was in a den of wolves, okay, hmm. and he was not a Mason. Lincoln was not a Mason, but as I, as I was coming out, now the guy handed me the brochure. As I was coming out, I got ready to answer the question, and the question I was going to ask the man, I said, "Why is Lincoln? Why is an obelisk on top of?" of Lincoln when he was not a Mason. But a couple people came in and, he, and, and they started asking questions and I never got an answer. But I was going to pin that man. I was going to pin it down. I was going to find out. You see, and and all the anti-Lincoln books, there's a lot of, and, and you'll find, they come out of, they come out of Georgetown. The, right of, the writers are from Georgetown University, you know, and, you know, we, I'm going to have to go here, but uh, I, you know, this broadcast, I hope, you know, I, I kind of, I, I appreciate Brett and yourself in the comments. I just want to go, I want to thank Brett again hmm. for okay. coming on because, because uh, I think, uh, I think when we give a broadcast like this, uh, you know, what we don't have, what we're missing, what sometimes that we yearn for, is some fellowship. If you if you know somebody, if 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 you if, if all you can do is talk to them, that's fine. That's better than nothing. But I have one person I can talk one on one in person. But there's a lot of people that I that I have met through this broadcast and through my website page that don't have anybody to talk to, and they need fellowship. See. Because, uh, uh, you know, the, the truth is stranger than fiction. Oh, yeah. Listen, um, so we come to an end. Is there any closing remarks that you have, Walt, for the moment? No, I just want to thank uh, Brett. You know, uh, I, I know I talked a lot on this, but I, I think uh, this broadcast uh, and the title of this broadcast, you know, The American Revolution, how America became a Jesuit enclave. One thing when you finish the little chapter, you can't argue. You might disagree at the beginning, and there's all, of course, the Patriots, they couldn't even stand to read the first chapter, okay? They couldn't even, they, you know. But there's no doubt that the United States of America is a Jesuit enclave. 
that isn't even up for debate. No. Nope. It's not up for speculation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in, in, in other words, we don't have to hang our heads. It's, it, you know, the truth of it is, now this might sound uh, harsh to somebody, but, uh, but America has been conquered. Lock, stock, and, and barrel, world. And in the, the New World Order, people are waiting for the New World Order. It is here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is in operation today. Mm-hmm. You know, and they, I mean, they have got the laws. You've got the executive laws that the presidents are passing. And all they need is some kind of event. Whatever that be, I'm not getting into that. I'm not getting into that. We'll see. But in other yeah. words, as, as children of God, we sit and watch. And I, my, my heart goes out to anybody that's listening. Don't get sucked into these sideshows. I mean, uh, I've learned when people attack me, you know, you know, they don't have enough information. Well, like George Washington. They'll, they'll attack you on George Washington. The more you're getting attacked, Walt, the, no, the more you know that you're on the right path. I can assure and, you and, that. And, and, and the main thing is when you do get attacked, when you do get attacked, is, is don't get, it's not necessary to get into an emotional part of it because... No, stand because fast. Listen, stand fast in the truth that fast. you hold, and that is the word of Christ. That's right. And, and, and nothing and, else. And that, that's, that's it. That's it. And, uh, and uh, that's why I, I'm, I'm, you know... Uh, Brett, I, I appreciate you coming on because I think uh, it would be good in the in the future that 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 uh, I know there's some guests out there that mm-hmm. uh, there's one thing I know that I've learned uh, by communicating a, l- a little bit is our listeners are very well researched, and uh, so when I when I come across to when our, when one of our uh, uh, listeners calls in, I'm mean, I'm all ears because I know I'm going to learn something from. Them. Because they, 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 you know, you know, uh, you know, four eyes are, are better than two, <laughs> and six are better than four. <laughs> is six, is six, is six are better than four. That's that, that's that's right. And that, in other words, it's when you find yourself, when you find yourself. Now, it, it's like it's like it's like a, 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 it's like the love that the Americans have for these founders. Mm-hmm. I, I don't let it bother me no more because uh, I realize they just don't have enough information. Well, the point is that the Americans, like all the other people in the world, in, their, in what country ever they are living, they have the wrong patriotism. They must have the patriotism to the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ and not some earthly country that is anyway in the kingdom of the Antichrist. And they should see through the deception that their leaders, whether in the United States of America, whether in the European Union, in China, in Africa, in Russia, in Latin America, or whatever, they only have one allegiance they swear to, and that is the Roman Catholic Church and the Antichrist that sits in Rome, showing himself that he is God, the man of perdition, or the son of perdition. And I want to say this, I'll close with this, you know, that, you know, America, the freedoms that I've had, millions of people, millions of people will never get the freedom that I've had that that living in America has afforded me. Oh, you were born at the right time. I was, and I, like, a, I was born in 1944. And, you know, and I slipped under Vietnam because I went in the military right out of school and it got out in 65 when it was coming. So when it started to step up and I've slipped under the, the door and, you know, and I and I had a period of my life when I was self-employed. I had bees. I used to build sheds. I'm a, I, I flew. I was a pilot for a while. I had my own airplane for 10 years. And, uh, those those times are gone. A working man like myself could never afford an airplane again. Couldn't afford the, the gas. The last time I checked was uh, uh, almost six dollars. Aviation gas was six dollars a gallon. Mm-hmm. You know. So so the, 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 and, and let me tell you the, the, the good things of this country. 
I mean, we didn't have property tax for a while. I forget what year the property tax, but people could own property. And you see, the reason why this country produced like it did, because it had incentive. Where did it get the incentive? It came from the Protestant work ethic, the Protestantism. It came, and what is Protestantism? I don't know if you got that at your tip of your tongue, York, but what is the short version that J.A. Wiley said? It's, you know... Protestantism know is revived Christianity after the uh, baptizing of pagan Rome. That's right. You see, and you see, I mean, you know, I was not educated like I wish I would have been and understood most of this when I was growing up, but I was still raised in a Protestant, I had pro Protestant, Protestantism in my relatives, you know, and I did see a difference between the Roman Catholic Church and, the, and I was raised in a Lutheran church, but I have watched and I was in the military for 62 and 65. I watched the change in the military in the three years that I was in. And, you know, and, uh, I, I just, I, and, and then we had the 70s, we had the 80s, and every decade was getting a little bit more um, Catholic. Uh, it was getting more Catholic. It was, it, 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 see, people don't, I, I, people don't realize that there's a lot of good Catholics out there, but they're not in the church. They're not in the Catholic church, but they think like a Catholic. And they act like a Catholic. And they act like a Catholic. All these evangelical churches. Yes, it's and because they don't have an understanding that Catholicism and the New Age is the same thing. Absolutely. So that's Absolutely. the big that's the big problem, you know. My my friend over here in um, in Belgium, I told you of him, uh, Tom, uh, who who said that he is not a practicing Catholic. I said, no, all right, you're not a practicing Catholic, but you are every day bombarded with Catholic teaching without even knowing it. And why don't you know it? Because you don't know the truth. Because you don't read the Bible. Because you do not believe in Jesus Christ. And he says, well, that's a fable, and that's man-written, and blah, 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 blah. You know, all these stupid arguments that people give you. Anyway, Walt, uh, yep. some closing yeah, remarks now? Or? <laughs> no, that's it. Uh, God bless. I appreciate, I appreciate everybody mm -hmm. for listening, and, and, uh, and, uh, and I thank Brett uh, for you coming on and making the comments. I, I, think, this, I think it's uh, – because, uh, yeah. see, Brett, Brett is just no different than anybody else or any of the listeners. We need some fellowship. We oh, need to okay. say, yeah, yeah, Brett, yeah, you're, you're, you can read. I yep. think, I think we have not heard the last of Brett on this broadcast. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> okay, well, I, I'm going to say goodbye to you right now. Then you can shut up for five minutes, and uh, Brett and I will bring this broadcast down to the end. Thank okay. you very much, Walt, for your contribution. Thank you, today. Walt. It was, it was uh, very interesting, as always. Everything that you brought up to the table is so righteous, and even though. You repeat yourself here and there. We do that also, but the truth cannot repeat it enough. Mm -hmm. So, for that matter, Walt, thank you very much for your contribution. And, Brett, uh, very nice that you could make it today to the broadcast. I would appreciate it if in the future you will have uh, also the possibility to come to our broadcast and share some thoughts with us. You didn't have that much time today, uh, also a little bit your fault. You just uh, you, you should just interrupt <laughs> Walt sometimes, you know. He needs them. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> sure, um, but, no uh, anyway, it's, it's just to getting a discussion on. But please, uh, maybe you have some closing remarks on yourself now. And uh, take the floor. Take, take a few minutes. Take your time. And uh, sure. share, share, share with our listeners whatever you want to share at the end of the broadcast. And then I have something to close it up. And uh, please, this is your moment now, Brad. Well, thank you, and uh, I, I can't say enough about my friends Walt Stickle and Jörg Glissman and their work with Tom Press and uh, First Amendment Radio and uh, um, Nicholas Arthur, who has been a rock, a foundation for us to stand on, and uh, I can't say enough good things about that man. Um, I've been uh, kind of following his his uh, program for a while and uh, he's a fellow carpenter and uh, he's worked with his hands and he knows the Lord and, and he's a repentant man 
and he's not living under the uh, the um, American dollar uh, system, and that takes a lot. Uh, I can vouch for that. Uh, it's pretty amazing uh, that he's been called by the Lord to do that, and uh, it's pretty tough to come to grips with uh, just how deep the Jesuit infiltration has come uh, because it's through centuries. It's not just today. It's through centuries. And to eyewitness that and to recognize it through the works of the Bavarian Illuminati and things like this, um, it just becomes something that is uh, so difficult uh, for one person uh, to to get a grasp on that you you really need brothers like Walt and Jorg and Tom and First Amendment Radio um, and uh, I proudly will say that uh, I really appreciate what they've done in the spirit and uh, just like First Corinthians has said uh, that according as it is written he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So let's not glory in what we've done. This is the work of the Lord. And it uh, uh, can't be said enough. And um, I'm just really thankful for the opportunity to just come on quickly and say a few words. And uh, that, uh, I'll hand it back to you, York. Okay. Thank you very much. And um, it, it's not about me. And it's not about Walt. Remember, it is all about and because of Jesus Christ. And we are just trying to do his work. And the more that you are affected by our work for him, the more you are affected by Jesus Christ. And he's the one to follow. Not me, not Walt, not Brad. Anyway, I want to close with a little reading. And I have to do this. It really speaks to me. Uh, I did that before. It comes from the allegory of the cave, where, uh, where you know that I made a video on. And it's just the introduction of that. And I want to put that it together in, uh, again to, uh, to put this uh, again into the minds of the people. Most people, including ourselves, live, live in a world of relative ignorance. We are even comfortable with that ignorance because it is all we know. When we first start facing the truth, the process may be frightening. And many people run back to their old lives. But if you continue to seek the truth, you will eventually be able to handle it better. In fact, you want more. It's true that many people around you <clears throat> know many things you are weird or even dangerous to... Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> it's true that many people around you now may think you are weird or even a danger to society, but you don't care. Once you've tasted the truth, you won't ever want to go back to being ignorant. And Jesus said it in the Bible, buy the truth and sell it not, and when you have the truth, the truth shall make you free. And with this, I want to end the broadcast today. Thank you very much for my guests, Walt Sickle and Brad Norman for attending, and also the guests in our chat room that have been very lively today. It was wonderful having the chat on the side. And uh, we're going to see you again next week, Thursday in the middle of when the Pope, the Antichrist, comes to the United States of America, we will have the opportunity to make a broadcast, and I can very surely assure you that we will not do any reading of the book next week, but we will probably have a very vivid, discuss vivid discussion on the Antichrist and his doings over there in the United States of America. So, thank you all very much for attending, and until next time, God bless you, and bye-bye. <laughs>